Hello, good evening and welcome to another program on Law and Order. As you know, law deals with almost every aspect of our life. And when we go on the road or take a flight or go on the sea or ship a good man uh, from the sea, law deals with that. And sometimes in most of the other countries, you see different people are traveling in different intermodal transport mechanisms. That is, you come from a train, get into a bus and go to your office and sometimes in the intermediary time you take a taxi. But today, we are going to focus on law and order on some aspects of laws that relates to transport. I'm not going to talk about transport laws that might entail you buying a ticket on a train, but transport laws that you might need to know on international transport. So today, we are going to talk about international transport law on law and order. And like always, we have expert guests uh, on that. And my guest today is once again, uh, Chandaka Jayasundara, President's Council, and a specialist in international transport law, among other things, Chandra. Thank you very much for coming you, back Jamaica. to the studio. I couldn't wish you for newly becoming a President's Council, and my wishes once again Thank you. Uh, uh, for that. And um, international transport law, when you hear about this, it looks a vast topic, and lots of different countries, like uh, different areas, like EU and all that might be having different uh, meaning. So I'm not going to ask you a definition, but can you tell me where does international transport law applies in which kind of a it, transaction? It is a vast subject <coughs> uh, because you are talking about transportation from one country to another. Yeah, that will entail different aspects. One is it entails a lot of, and there are applicable conventions, international conventions that apply to certain carriage uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. Then, depending on the area, say for example, South America has a separate convention, treaty, uh, or grouping dealing with transport in South America. There's one, there's one set of conventions for Europe, then there are other conventions for China and Russia, there's other laws. Then we have the common law countries like Sri Lanka and India, we have a completely different set of laws. So, generally, it's a vast area, but because of the f divergence of the laws and systems that are used from the early 20th century there was a intention by the international community to mm -hmm. unify and have a uniform set of laws mm -hmm. for different aspects of transport mm -hmm. so the first development was for carriage by sea uh, which from nine first convention or the first agreement was in 1924 which was amended in 28 and now we have the Hague Bisbee rule which is in 1968. Mm. So that is the latest, latest with regard to carriage by sea. Mm. Then with regard to carriage by rail we don't have any laws. Mm -hmm. We still have the old uh, common law but in Europe there is the international convention of rail car carriage by rail. Mm. Then uh, you have the international convention on carriage by road especially for uh, for uh, Europe. Mm. Then for air, and air carriage you have the Warsaw Convention which was I think around 1978 or so. Yeah. So that, so those uniform systems of law, convention laws apply for most transportation. So the, so the intricacies, the, the complexities are much less. So you, if you just study the separate conventions which are as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, air, the Warsaw Convention is applicable, uh, the Hague Bispeed convention is applicable. So, mm, if you study those, you don't have to know what the law in England is or because it's generally the same convention mm -hmm. laws. So, that has been sorted out generally. The problems that we face now are what is called the law relating to intermodal transportation. Right. Intermodal means different modes. Yes. You use it in say for example, transportation of people, yes. like you get onto your car, yes. get into your car, go to your st railway station, get into the railway, mm. then you get into the train, get down, get into a bus, go to your office. That's f four modes of transport. So yes. you have car, rail, uh, bus and walking. Mm. It's the same way with goods. Right. Intermodal means for a particular part of the carriage, you use say a lorry to carry your goods. Okay. Then you use sea carriage. Okay then you might use air carriage or road or rail carriage. So it's using different modes of transport 
for different areas of carriage. Mm. That is intermodal. Mm. So the problem, can I expand on yes, that? Yes, yeah. please do. Uh, so the problem is you have different laws for each segment. So you have a different law for the road part, you have a different law convention for the carriage at the sea part, then you have another for the rail part. So each there's a problem as to say you ship proper like goods in good order say in Colombo and it ends up in I don't know say London or wherever mm -hmm. the goods are damaged so the first problem is to ascertain or localize or locate the place where it got damaged so if it happened during the sea carriage then one law will apply yes but if it happens during the uh, rail carriage mm. then one convention will apply so there's a lot of confusion as to what particular law will apply mm. so they are trying there is a convention of uh, 1982 multimodal convention in 1980 uh, that was never it has never been uh, implemented because nobody wa nobody signs up for it then there is another convention a recent convention again although most countries have signed it some have most have not ratified it because it's complicated it's very very complicated so the problem then is where to localize the damage if you localize it there is no problem then that particular convention will apply but if you can't localize it you don't know where it happens then what do you do do you have a uniform system of law for the entire carriage or you have specific different laws mm. so th that that idea is that you when you can't localize it then you have a uniform system of law that's what they tried with the multimodal convention or you use the uh, use a general convention which is a problem that is the problem everybody is still grappling with mm. so th as far as transportation law now is concerned the biggest or the most complicated is with regard to multimodal law. Right. Now, uh, when you uh, will say, we'll take the exa two examples, like you said about ship, <coughs> not the domestic thing, from port to port, or uh, the same good uh, carried by air uh, from the factory to uh, the receiver, the retail or wholesale, what is the type of contract you enter into for this? Are there like standard forms or are there like a separate contract? There are. There are. That, that again is a because the nature of international transport now it's complicated mm -hmm. because because of this fact that the whole thing started with the introduction of containers containers right. were originally used somewhere in the 1950s in in the united states yeah. where they thought they should have a uniform box mm. to fit into a railroad car uh -huh. right mm. so the railroad the the I don't know what to call it, the, the, the railroad car mm. was basically 20 by 10, mm -hmm. right? Mm. So, uh, they produced this box, which is 20 by, which is basically 20 cubic meters. Mm. So, that's why you call TEU, 20 TEU is mm. that. So, which could be used in the railway carriage, mm. you, so you slot it in, the, takes it there, mm. then you take it out and put it into a lorry, mm. which is also at the same dimension of the box. Mm. Then you go and put it into a ship, which has slots according to the each dive. So the dimension, so it's a uniform box mm. that you carry from one place to the other place to other. Those days shipping was quite easy. It was if it is general cargo, it was in gunny bags or chest, tea chest, if you are talking about tea. Uh, or if it was bulk cargo, where the entire ship was sugar or entire ship was mm. wheat or whatever. Yeah. So it's with containerization that all these problems arose because mm. now you put your, the seller will put all your goods in a container, seal it, send it off mm. and it will come to the buyer unopened without the seal being broken unless some customs officer has mm. looked at it. So and it goes through these different modes of transportation. So at one point there will be say if you are taking it from say Katunayaka to Port of Colombo there will be the lorry, the lorry Mudalali who does the carriage. So that's one transport. So your contract is with that guy. Mm. Then you will have the C, C car carriage that will be a separate transaction. Then you have whatever the other carriages at the end. So the problem then is you have so many things to do with so many people for international carriage. 
that brought into existence what is called uh, a freight forwarder. A freight forwarder is somebody who takes the responsibility upon himself, actually not responsibility, he carries your cargo from Colombo to say the United Kingdom, he looks after everything, he gets the mudalali for the, to lorry, uh, for the lorry, then he uh, engages a shipping line to carry it, the sea, and everything he engages. And for that he issues one simple document. Mm. And the problem is the way it is structured, freight forwarders, the saying is it came in one old judgment, it says we will carry you anything, but we will not be responsible for anything. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because every time something happens, they say, look, this is not my problem, this was done by the ship owner. Mm. Right? So the problem is that, but this creature called the freight forwarder came up in the 1970s, 80s. So now most of this, that is the, co the consolidation factor is done by a freight forwarder. Mm. So generally you have standard contracts for freight forwarders mm. uh, done by the Freight Forwarders International Association that is used and accepted by everybody. So that is a standard. Then for the ship, ship the, the sea transport, there is the, the standard what are all BIMCO, there are several mm. standard uh, bills of lading, those are used. So, you do not have to reinvent the wheel, most of the terms are there in those documents. Mm. Uh, so, standard documents are there, airway bills also are standard documents that we are all the components of the conventions are included. So, generally you have standard term contracts for these, everything. Right. So, um, basically you are saying with this air or sea, it's basically the same kind of documentation that goes in. Uh, yeah. Generally, uh, because for sea carriage, you have what is called the bill of lading. Mm. Uh, for air carriage, you have the airway bill. Mm. Legal ramifications are different, legal ob obligations are different, but basically that is the document on which the goods are transported. Okay. What are the legal ramifications and obligations different in this? Yeah. So, say for example, the bill of lading that is used in carriage of goods. Yeah has three comp three components. Yeah. So, it is a, a title to the goods. Yeah. right? So, if you have the bill of lading, that means you have title to the goods. Mm. Because you have to produce the original bill of lading at the destination port of discharge and whoever who brings the original bill of lading, the ship owner is obliged mm. under law to deliver the goods to you. Mm. So, that is the key. As they say, the bill of lading is the key to the warehouse. So, if you produce the original bill of lading, then you have to give it. So, that is the first component. Uh, then it is of course, the best evidence for the, it is not the contract of carriage, but it is the best, uh, best uh, evidence as to the terms and conditions of the contract of carriage. Yes. Right? And the third component is you have it is a document of title, it is the best evidence of the contract of carriage. And the third component is that it is used, uh, it is endorsable. Right? So, you can transfer title by endorsing the contract. Mm -hmm. right? I'm very sorry, the third component just slipped my mind. That's okay. But, uh, but those are the basic. Mm -hmm. But in an airway bill, you do not have those, especially the transferability of the uh, uh, airway bill is not there. Mm -hmm. Whoever who takes the goods to the aircraft or delivers it to the airline, we will have to collect it. So, most of the, com because it is a least, less developed system, mm -hmm. most of the components of the bill of lading is not there in the uh, airway bill. Mm -hmm. It is different. Yeah. Now, when a human is transported, we were talking about the yeah. goods transport through these two mechanisms, either passenger cruise ships or largely air transport. What are the uh, laws that get involved probably other than the immigration thing with the passengers to sort yeah. out the visas and uh, the insurance? Uh, are these the only type of uh, uh, No, there are different and laws? Say especially for air, uh, air, uh, air travel, yeah. the there Warsaw Convention has specific uh, with regard to the baggage mm. and air transport. Even, even in shipping, there are separate uh, conventions and separate laws mm. with regard to carriage of passengers. There is a difference between the carriage of passengers mm. and the carriage of goods. Mm. Generally, carriage of goods is generally, uh, there are conventions, carriage of passengers have ca certain conventions, but also it has a lot of common law, the old common law mm. principles applicable, especially for rail transport, it is the old English common law uses that are used. Okay. Uh, is Sri Lanka 
Now, we are trying to uh, go into a globalization uh, regime for a long time, but is Sri Lanka, has, has it ratified all the necessary, uh, uh, those international conventions which facilitate uh, international goods and passenger transport? Yes, because the most up-to-date is, uh, with regard to sea carriage, mm. uh, is uh, the Hague Visby, mm. which became law here in 1982. Mm. Then we have for carriage by air, we have the Warsaw Convention mm. that is, I think, in 78 or 79. Uh, we haven't ratified the multimodal law. We haven't ratified uh, the next development of the Hague Wispy, which was the Hamburg rules, which we haven't ratified. But then nobody, majority of the countries have not ratified mm -hmm. it. It's more or less out of, it's nobody's using it. Mm -hmm. Then the latest is the Rotterdam rules. We haven't ratified it. I don't know what whether we have even looked at it. Mm -hmm. uh, so other than that is multimodal and freight forwarding. And don't you think we should ratify them? I said we should definitely since it? since we are like Colombo is like the twenty third largest port in the world. Right. We are one of the biggest exporters of tea, mm -hmm. cinnamon in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, garments. So we need this because the transportation sector is not going to sit around and wait until the laws change exactly so they keep on changing the ways of their doing their business yeah, yeah. now for example freight forwarding or logistic providers have gone way beyond what the original provider of logistics mm. that is our providing transport they are going to what is called third party logistics or fourth party logistics that is a company doesn't have a separate shipping division hmm. doesn't have a separate uh, warehouse division hmm. it's all outsourced to companies hmm. and there are companies in Sri Lanka who do that internationally hmm. right so they do look after the warehousing they look after the distribution they look after the transportation so that is th generally third party logistics are the 3 pl 4 it's 2 pl 3 pl 4 pl so now that is something that is developing very fast and there is no law and the way we change our laws by the time we change the law or we introduce the law, it will be about 25 PL or something. Yeah. What are the advantages you see in these, uh, the changes to this uh, Hague thing and uh, the Rotterdam uh, yeah. rules, which we are not adapted, and you mentioned one thing yeah. else as well. What are the advantages of adopting that? Advantages means because, because we, our law might stay at one point without mm. going anywhere, mm. but the law internationally changes. Mm. Now, as far as... So, if I may interrupt, if, when we ha when you have in the position of not ratified, are there situations that... Uh, lesser international transport will come here, like lesser, uh, they will be discouraged to come here. Definitely so, uh -huh. because Less you protection. do need that for uniformity in the system. Now the problem is, as lo our laws not developing domestically, it doesn't matter, uh, it matters, mm -hmm. but as far as our, our discussion is concerned, it doesn't matter, yeah. because that relates to people in the country. Yes, yes. But these are situations where we are dealing with people outside, outside the country. Yeah. And if they are not happy that our laws are up to a certain degree, of uniformity with the international yeah. international laws yeah. or the conventions, then they will think twice because there are enough countries which have set up the legal background, the legal basis to do trade. Yeah. So if we don't do it, the, the business will go somewhere else. It's imperative that we have, especially in international trade, we have the most modern systems of law operable in the country. Right. Now, um, have, have this been mooted out by uh, uh, it has been dis di discussed by the, the by the trade by mm. by lawyers mm. uh, more more than the lawyers yes. it's a trade, trade. it's they the industries done. because yeah. they need the laws exactly but uh, action is nothing, is nothing is happening nothing is happening so mm. they are themselves they are devising ways by yeah. contractual agreement to bring into operation that is that can be done internationally not every country is completely yes. super efficient in law yes. so Say for example the the freight forwarder standard terms or the BIMCO terms, they are all they are all contractual. So freight forwarders in Sri Lanka or carriers carriers you can, liners you can't, but freight forwarders in Sri Lanka can agree contractually mm -hmm. to bring in provisions of the conventions into your transaction. Even if Sri Lanka doesn't bring the convention into operation, mm -hmm. they Industry will bring those terms into operation, but it is contractually. So mm. there is no state enforcement or uh, the country, the, the state process can't use, you can't use the state process 
to enforce it. But as a normal case, you can enforce those rights because you bring the convention terms into your contract as a contractual term. Is it valid if we were to go to litigation? Definitely, Definitely because it's a, it's a term that the parties have agreed with. The source is irrelevant. Yes. As long as we agree, we can enforce it in agreement. Right. Now, uh, most of these disputes that we were discussing in our previous program about international uh, mm -hmm. trade, uh, the most difficult thing is to enforce and we are to find a defaulter. Uh, now, when there's a dispute of international transportation with a person or a good on air or sea, are there any mechanism tribunals that are set up in internationally specifically and speedily to deal with them? In or transport, uh, in most international trade, you have your standard, you have the ICC system right. where for alternate dispute resolution. Right. So you have arbitration, then you have mediation and conciliation, yeah. but arbitration you have the ICC. Then also industry specific or mm. commodity specific, you have arbit dispute resolution process. So for example, mm -hmm. the sugar mm. industry will has a sugar association in London. There's a process of doing that. Mm. So maritime, there's London maritime arbitration. Mm. That is a huge industry there. Mm. We that is only for shipping? Only for maritime matters. Maritime matters. Then for sugar association, sugar matters. Yes. For wheat, you have separate. Mm. For coal, you have separate. Because you have charter, separate charter parties, everything is specific. So. Uh, that way and then arbitration as I said earlier you have the New York Convention enforcement procedure is very easy mm -hmm. of course if we had time we could have gone into litigation and how you yeah. can enforce your claims by admiralty yeah. uh, where you have pre-judgment security mm -hmm. that is litigation the most attractive is to get pre-judgment that mm -hmm. is doing uh, getting vessels arrested or getting marine injunctions mm -hmm. but other than that Enforceability, the most most effective is arbitration, but it is also the most co costly. Yeah, but you don't have a tribunal like the London Maritime uh, uh, System, uh, not here. I mean, for aviation transport, not air transport. Not that I am yeah. sorry. Uh, not that I not know a tribunal of. No, set up I don't by, think uh, so. If I'm, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. But I'm. I I haven't looked at that part, yeah. so I can't. Yeah, I don't. But. From what I know, there is there no is. such thing. So, so you're about to answer London Maritime uh, Dispute Resolution Mechanism is very, you said, lucrative. Do you think we we should have something like that in Asia? We or have. Do we have uh, no, we have. We have in Singapore. Singapore. We have the uh, SIAC, that is Singapore Institution uh, International Arbitration Centre, which is well developed and also is superbly organised yeah. and recognised, internationally recognised. Yeah. Uh, being the 23rd biggest port in the world we are yeah. having, we should have uh, something like basically that. Basically, right? all our disputes, we are either settling it in an admiralty case or yeah. we are dis resolving it in admiralty yeah. or in arbitration outside Sri Lanka. It's very little arbitration that happens in Sri Lanka. Mm. It's developing. It might develop with Sri Lanka coming in as a hub. It mm. might develop. Mm. But at the moment, if you want uh, speedy solutions, you need to go to Singapore or London. Expensive though. Mm. It's much cheaper to do it here. Right. Chandaka, thank you once again for joining Law and thank Order. You, thank you for those very insightful thoughts on a very uh, rare subject on law, that is transport law, international thank transport you. law. Thank you for joining Thanks us once again. Thank you. That's Law and Order for today. And uh, Chandaka Jansinta, specialist on international transport law, was my guest, uh, President's Council. And we'll see you next week with another episode on Law and Order. Have a good night. And don't forget to go into our Facebook page. That's Facebook slash Law and Order. Uh, channel I and post your comments and your queries. Have a good night and have a good weekend.